Well, hello, Monty, and thank you for joining us today. Love your background. Um, we are here to talk about, uh, about teaching in these uh, times, but also to know a little bit more about yourself. So I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about uh, yourself and uh, your classes during the spring quarter. Sure. Thanks a lot. And it's very good to see you, uh, Christina. And um, I am a professor in the Department of Philosophy. My research and teaching concentrates on history of philosophy, especially Greek philosophy. I am also the director of the Classical Studies program, which is located in the Institute of Arts and Humanities. And so that program oversees Greek and Latin instruction uh, here at the university. And uh, so that's mostly what my uh, teaching and research uh, concentrates on. My um, re main research project right now is I'm trying to reconstruct a lost work of Aristotle out of fragments of this lost work that are quoted in later ancient authors, trying to produce a critical Greek edition and translation and commentary uh, of that work. Uh, but my, um, my teaching mostly deals with introduction to philosophy, uh, lower division Greek, lower and upper division Greek philosophy, and uh, history of philosophy. But I also teach graduate seminars. In fact, I teach at all levels, freshman seminars, lower division courses, upper division courses, graduate seminars, also running uh, various reading groups and workshops, which, which I'll comment on in due course. So I, I'm curious. Uh, I think that one of the ways uh, our disciplines in the humanities, uh, uh, philosophy, literature, history, um, can respond to, to the pandemic is through the syllabus and what we are teaching in class. So do you feel that you have responded to that through your teaching, the way you, um, you designed your syllabi and so on? Yes, well, uh, first of all, I should have said a little bit about which courses I was already planning to teach. And, and somewhat unfortunately, I had weighted a lot of my teaching into this quarter. So I had a very large introduction to philosophy course that had 70 people and an upper division course on Hellenistic uh, philosophy. And so I changed the syllabus of both of those courses uh, as things were starting up and I knew that we were going online, changed the syllabus both in the sense of the um, expectations and evaluation schemes of the course, but also, and I think this is what you're getting at, the content of the course. So I kept some of the traditional material in the Introduction to Philosophy course that I thought would continue to be relevant. For example, Plato's Dialogue, The Gorgias, which is about uh, about politics and justice and education, that's kind of always useful, but there's ways that that dialogue especially has resonated uh, with current events unfolding. I assumed that it would, and the reason I had originally assigned it is it being an election year, I wanted to discuss mm -hmm. political propaganda, campaigns, persuasion, rhetoric, that sort of thing. But then these political um, issues as they've basically on a daily basis escalated that uh, worked well. I also um, added two texts that I normally wouldn't do that are historical texts that deal with uh, the plague. So one of them is Lucretius's book uh, De Rerum Natura or On the Nature of Things, which is a, a, a uh, Latin epic didactic poem. We read it in translation, of course, and it is kind of an instruction manual on how to maintain tranquility in times of crisis. For Lucretius, it was the collapse of the Roman Republic and the various things that were happening in the first century BC. Uh, all of these have basically have parallels to what's happening to us now, 
but the whole work culminates in a description of the Athenian plague. Uh, and it, you're supposed to, in reading the horrific and graphic description of what's happening in the plague, apply the principles of Epicureanism learned in the earlier books in order to kind of maintain tranquility in the face of it. So that work is basically a perfect thing to try to give you practical philosophical uh, ideas that can be applied to, to, to managing your uh, emotions and tension and anxiety in the face of various crises, including um, disease and, and health problems. The other work that I added to the syllabus, and I think I'll, it, it was so successful that I think I'll just always be teaching this, whether we have a pandemic or not, <clears throat> but is um, Albert Camus' uh, The Plague, or Le Peste, which he published in 1947, a fictional account of the plague affecting an Algerian town called Iran uh, in the 40s. And the whole thing is actually a parable for the plague of fascism in Europe because Camus was part of the French resistance and he wrote it as kind of a grand allegory. Uh, but the, the surface uh, things in the book about how people denied that it was happening, denied it was important, dithering of, of public officials, the heroism of healthcare workers, um, the way information spread, how people react to the quarantine, them feeling that, that their freedom is being infringed on, and even them protesting against it, rioting, looting, all of this is in that book. And the the students were simply stunned at the, the parallels between the book, and they thought, my God, this is, this is why we need to study history. Actually, I, ha I had to continually explain to them that this isn't a history book, that this was actually a work of fiction, because they thought it, it's so closely tracking what's happening now that it must actually be an account of something that did happen. Um, and so that, uh, that work has just been incredible and it brings together, it also talks about different philosophical techniques for coping with losing your freedom and, and um, fearing uh, health disasters and what we owe to other people and um, how we ought to change our behavior in light of it. And in the Hellenistic uh, philosophy class, I added works also of consolation, works by Seneca, consolation about his exile. Um, there he's talking about being exiled to the island of Corsica, um, but here we're all exiled into our own homes, but he gives us way to, ways to think about it being good and how we ought to make use of our exile from other people and things like that. Also works on justice and mercy. In that, so I think I think the, you know, uh, what works we're reading. There are so many good works that can in 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 history, in art, in philosophy, in literature, um, that can help uh, help us cope with this situation. So that's one thing I'm very glad to have done. It took me out of my comfort zone of the text that I normally teach, but it, it I think it actually resulted in a much better class in both cases. If uh, if your students uh, are interested in digesting 400 pages of Italian narrative, maybe you can recommend the Promessi Sposi, and uh, that's also a, that's a historical novel yeah. actually, and it has resonated with me so profoundly this uh, this quarter, and I wish I could have uh, been teaching it, and uh, um, reading uh, the final chapter on uh, the end of the pandemic is. Uh, um, is, has been a um, cathartic experience uh, uh, for me and help, certainly helped me cope uh, with, uh, with the situation at hand. And uh, that book too um, expresses some of the issues that you have explained so well. But now I want to switch a little bit into, um, into more of the structural uh, side of your, of your teaching, the technical changes that happened when you had to move your classroom remotely, so not only content, but really change, changes in the way you present
present that content. And I wanted to know a little bit about how you adapted to, um, to the new platform and maybe what, what challenges you faced and how you overcame them. Sure. Um, well, first I'll, I'll talk about the technical changes that I affected and then the uh, challenges. So first of all, uh, because of the situation, the, the university put out various guidelines about how we should accommodate our students and them being in various remote locations. And in fact, I confirmed that I had students located in India, China, the UK, um, New York, and so forth. So basically all over the globe. And so there was not going to be a way to have a kind of synchronous lecture where we all get together and, and have a discussion at the same time. So I decided that I wanted to have the, the basis of the class be asynchronous lectures, meaning lectures that they could play uh, and pause and go back to in their time and then have the discussion happening in, in, in a different way. So this, this requires um, producing these asynchronous lectures. And I did many of them new, uh, just speaking to my computer over slides and then uploading those slides. Um, by the way, up uploading those slide slides to YouTube, where they're then given very garbled closed captioning, which my mother, Tish Johnson, has edited for me. So oh, man, uh, this is great. Incredible <laughs> drudgery of yeah. listening to 50 or 60 hours of me lecturing, and she's gone through and carefully corrected all of the spellings. For example, it, when I would say Epicurean, YouTube would correct it to Happy Korean every time. So that, that needed, those kind of things needed to be adjusted. Um, some of them I was able to adapt from podcasts of lectures. So our university has this wonderful facility where you can basically flip a switch and it will automatically generate podcasts of the, your, from just lectures and slides that you're giving in the room. So I had several years of those built up, which I was then able to harvest and, and break into smaller clips and uh, upload and use. So that was, that was the basis of the kind of lecturing was moving over into actually kind of produced lectures. Most of them, most of them with slides, but with audio and, and of various lengths. Um, then the other thing that I did was holding open office hours over uh, Zoom so that I would be available to the students in the time, the actual time zone that it was scheduled to meet, you know, 12 to 1 on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or whatever. Um, and then students could drop in and stay for that as long or as little as they wanted. If they just wanted to ask a clarification question, they could just ask it, I would answer it, and they could leave or they could ask discussion questions and they could hear the answers to other uh, students' questions and even join in the discussion. And then those discussions were automatically recorded and uploaded to, uh, to, to, to the learning management software called Canvas so that students who couldn't be there in that time zone could also look at that discussion and, uh, and learn from it. Um, the other thing is that I, um, scheduled one-on-one -on -one meetings with students in the upper division class so that I could actually lay eyes uh, on, on each of them. Um, and that, that kind of gets into the uh, challenges. The one huge challenge is just feeling like you're sp speaking to a blank screen or that it's not real and we don't, I mean, I'm, it's, it's much better when I'm alive and talking to students in an actual classroom. So the, the videos that I adapted from podcasts of me actually lecturing and where students are interjecting comments and so forth, I think are in general much better and much more fun to listen to the, than the ones that I just program and I'm, and I'm speaking over slides. I just, I, I, I can't seem to be as good and, and, and as animated when I'm just talking in an empty 
room as when I'm actually communicating with students. So I needed some way to deal with that problem of feeling disconnected from the students and feeling like I'm not getting any feedback. I just put something out there and then maybe they're learning and maybe they aren't. And so I uh, instituted a program of meeting with individual students. And when I do this in the future, and we can talk about that later, I'm planning on expanding that quite a bit. Another um, challenge is just discussion. How do you maintain discussion? And here, um, I realized I'd never done this before, but setting up discussion boards on the learning management software and requiring the students to contribute discussion. And I did it in the following way. Everybody must post one comment of about 100 words in length based on that week's reading by midnight on Wednesday to the discussion board and they cannot see the other students' comments until they have posted their own comment, and then they have until midnight on Friday. And you'd be amazed how many students are working on Lucretius at midnight on Friday, it turns out. <laughs> um, posting, then posting a reply to another student's comments. And I was delighted to find out that this has vastly improved the discussion. I will always do this because there, first of all, it's not time constraints of 50 minutes in a classroom and sorry, we couldn't get to all the questions. Now everybody can and, and in fact is, is required to contribute. But also many of the best students in our classes are often the ones that don't raise their hands first and aren't the ones that are called on and or that don't even perhaps want to speak at all, but they have something to contribute and so them being able to, to post a written comment. Uh, and, and I just found that the discussion has never been better in my, in my classes, actually. I was, I was astonished to, 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 to find this out. Um, the, another challenge was textbooks. Um, so there is always a problem of, of, of students using various textbooks and using various electronic versions and then page numbers being wrong and then it being difficult to, to grade or follow up with them. So I decided that I would just create um, free textbooks for the entire, for, for, for the class and then we would all be using the same one. So I went into publicly available, public domain yeah. books through the internet archive, um, edited them down myself in the format that I wanted, produced instructions on how exactly to cite these, and then gave away all of the all of my textbooks. And I, I'm now committed to doing this. You know, the state of California wants us to do this and so forth. But I am I am going to always just provide the textbooks for students in my in my class uh, classes going forward. Um, the final the final challenge is uh, feedback. You're not able to give students direct feedback on their assignments by them visiting an office hour. So to some extent that is handled by these one-on-one -on -one meetings. But I also designed a series of assignments that was always some kind of cumulative thing where uh, there were drafts and they were revising something in response to comments. Since I don't, since I wasn't able to meet them individually and so forth, I can't really control what kinds of sources they're using and one's always concerned about plagiarism and, and, and that sort of thing. So I designed the assignment so that I could gauge how they were responding exactly to criticism that I was given, giving. For example, they had to write a book report and then I gave them uh, corrections to that, they had to implement those corrections and in some cases expand them and so forth. And then those book reports got posted for the uh, benefit of all the other students and then the students could read those and be directed to things for larger research assignments based on them. So those are some of the technical changes I affected and some of the challenges I had and how I, how I addressed those challenges. Of course, I would make more, there are other challenges yet to come and, and there are things that still need uh, improvement, but that's how most of them are.
Well, it looks like uh, it's, it's been a massive endeavor and I really would like to express gratitude as well as admiration for the enormous amount of work you're done, you've done here. Uh, I, I was also very interested in what you said about the learning experience for the students because it looks like uh, when handled with the care and expertise uh, you have given to, to the platform, uh, it seems that uh, we are really getting in a place uh, where we can serve or we, we, we can provide a more nuanced experience for different type of learners. And the fact, for example, that you noticed that some of the quieter students are those who write, you know, the best essays. I've experienced that many times. And uh, um, there are many reasons why that happens. And so the ability to be taking advantage of the chat feature, as you um, explained, uh, is give, gives us a, a better opportunity to reach and engage students where they are the most comfortable and at the same time pushing them uh, towards a learning, maybe less than comfortable zone, but uh, which allows them to improve in areas where they can and feel like they, they want to improve. So uh, I, I think that this brings me to my last question, Monty, and I wanted to ask, uh, uh, you know, when we transition back to in-person or maybe a combination of uh, remote and in-person, what will you keep? Uh, and maybe also, do you think uh, this platform may be useful for other uses, uh, such as, uh, you know, remote interaction by scholars uh, on uh, important aspects of the humanities uh, and uh, reading groups and round table and so forth? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so... Definitely things are going to change a lot for my teaching going forward. And, you know, uh, thank you uh, for thanking me for it. I, I really have just poured everything into trying to reimagine how to do teaching in this, uh, in this situation. I was very concerned because I had a lot of doubts about online only uh, education. I'm constantly talking about online education with um, my partner who teaches courses online um, at a community college. Uh, and so I was very concerned about how it was all going to work out. And I'm, I'm, I'm relieved that some things have worked very well and that, and that I think the problems are tractable. Um, so going forward, I'm probably going to use what they call this, the, the flipped classroom model, where instead of lecturing, to the students, I will have put lecture elements into these videos, which they can watch and rewatch and rewind and pause on their own time, and then devote the classroom time to discussion, to breaking into small group discussion or with the larger group, uh, role playing activities, debates, things like that. That uh, that that you need to be in person. Uh, and so I think that that, that that will result in a much more active and lively um, classroom situation. Uh, another thing is that I will continue to use these facilities to have alternate meetings. So one-on-one -on -one consultations with students. Just It's fairly easy to just schedule so that you literally meet and can touch base with each student. You know, we ideally hope that that happens in office hours and we implore them to drop by and then a few keen students do or the same ones always come, but you yeah. don't necessarily meet them all. But with, with this mechanism, there's, there's a fairly easy way to meet with them and say, tell me about your interests. What do you want to get out of the class? What do you want to work on? You know, what's, what do you, what do you, uh, what are your objectives in the class? And then I can take that into consideration and adapt the class uh, to them. Also, we can have large group meetings or uh, break into smaller groups through uh, Zoom. Now, in the fall, I am teaching an experimental class with a teaching professor here named Andy Lamy. We're putting on a role-playing game about the birth of democracy in Athens, and we're doing it all uh, online. And so we're going to be using, we're, we're, we're discussing various ways to use these techniques to adapt for that. There's a lot of experimental elements to how 
how that works, but I think that the technology can be used for that. And definitely once we, if we get back to some kind of hybrid thing where we're meeting and we can continue to use these, I think it will be even better. So I, I was a very reluctant person who's now become a, a, a true believer in at least hybridizing these courses using some of this technology. It allows you to bring in more students, guarantee that everybody's part of the discussion, gives you more opportunities for meeting one-on-one, -on -one, and there are a lot of, of advantages to it. I, I can't wait to get back into a physical live uh, classroom, because that's really what I've trained to do and, 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 and um, what I've always wanted to do. But I, I, I no longer have the kind of hostility I had towards towards all things uh, online teaching. I think I think this is that I've really learned through experience that a lot of these things can, can make classes better in various ways and attack various weaknesses that I had as a teacher. Thank you so much, Monty. Thank you, Christina. I look forward to seeing you again in person and hopefully in that in that building that's behind you, right? Absolutely. Can't wait to move. Okay. Thank bye, you. Bye, Monty. Bye-bye.